Hi, I'm Christian and this is Lazy Devs Academy and today I will be doing a bit of a deep dive on this game that you probably never heard of. This is GGLS3. It came out as part of the Elast collection on the Switch and PS4 in December 2020 in Japan. The reason why I want to look at this is because it is a remarkable game. It is a shmup that has been made quite recently and it came out in 2020 but it has been developed for the specs of old hardware. It is a Sega Game Gear game. That's right, a game from 2020 made for a 30 year old console. On top of that, it's made by a highly experienced team of shmup developer veterans. That's fascinating to me. It shows off how far we've come, how modern design sensibilities and you know modern development techniques, uh, you know what they can do when applied to restrictions of old hardware. That's something I want to talk about and yeah you might be already seeing where this is going. This year I want to be working on a video series on how to make a great shmup on uh, the Pico 8 Fantasy console and so I'm looking at this game specifically to potentially learn some things. How to make a good shmup within harsh hardware limitations. So without any further ado, this is my full playthrough of this game. Let's go! And right away I want to actually pause at this cutscene and discuss two things. I'm sorry, I won't be pausing the game later on, but I have to now. I want to discuss two things. Uh, I want to discuss this sequence and I also want to explain some of the uh, core game mechanics. So in this video I want to be talking a little bit about the storytelling of shmups, because this is typically not something you even think about. Shmups are not known for storytelling and the idea of discussing their story might even seem ridiculous. When we think of story, we think, you know, of cutscenes, of dialogues, of characters talking to each other, and shmups usually don't have these, and if they do, they are super annoying. But hopefully what I can actually demonstrate is that shmups actually do tell stories, they just tell them quite differently. And we need to broaden our understanding of what storytelling is and how it works in order to appreciate it. And I think this sequence might cue us in, although admittedly it is a bit of a traditional cutscene. So it's funny and weird to me how so many games, so many shmups start with this kind of sequence. You see this in shmups like Raiden, uh, Ketsui, Crimson Clover, you name it. You quite often have the sequence where um, there is like the player's ship and it's launched into space from some kind of carrier. And as a dev, something I'm asking myself is why? Why did the devs decide to put this, uh, to include this kind of sequence at the beginning? And in this case, I have two theories. I think on the one hand, it's a super efficient way to establish a background for the upcoming action. So the whole sequence is something that we are all actually already very familiar with. We are all familiar with this from real life. This is an iconic image from how uh, the US Navy operates. This is an image that has been especially prominent in the late 70s and early 80s in movies and on TV. You've seen this in movies like Top Gun, you've seen this on uh, TV shows like Battlestar Galactica, Macross slash Battletech or Mobile Suit Gundam. So this sequence is actually a bit of a trope, a stereotype. Now tropes often get a lot of flack for you know being something that's unoriginal or even harmful and often there's good reasons for that i'm not going to deny that um something uh, that we don't discuss so much is why do we even use tropes in the first place what are the advantages of using tropes and the upside of using tropes i think is that they can be an incredibly efficient and quick way to convey ideas instead of spelling out a whole backstory of who you are in this game and why you're here you can just throw in this visual shorthand to tap into the things the audience already knows you just show them this one image and people will be able to pull from all those other media TV shows that I already saw and fill in the blanks. So okay, we now know that this is some kind of military operation, our protagonist is a fighter pilot, we are stationed on some kind of capital ship, there is some kind of military emergency and we are now launched into action. Case closed. Now one could argue that you don't need to strictly establish those things and that's kind of true yes of course there's plenty of good shmups that just start immediately into an actual level uh, gradius does it r-type does this it's fine 
But on the other hand, it's nice to give the audience some kind of narrative foothold, and the amount of work this little sequence does to establish the theme and setting of the game is remarkable. It's just a few seconds and the payoff is so good, it's such an easy choice to make as a dev. Just imagine how much dialogue you'd need to spell out all this backstory otherwise, right? So that was my first explanation, my first theory. Uh, the second explanation is a lot more simpler. So I think one of the reasons why shmups are so fun is something I call the toy box design. Um, these games usually feature this huge collection of ships and tanks and robots. And um, in a very immediate sense, these things are just fun and cool. It's fun to look at them. It's fun to see them do their things. It's the same kind of fun that you had when you, as a kid, when you opened up a, a huge box of toys and you laid them out on your carpet and you played around with them, you know, you made them do things. That's the kind of joy I'm talking about. And I think this kind of launch sequence kind of plays into this. It's just fun to see a little spaceship launched into space like that, to marvel at this miniature machinery at work. I know, not necessarily a blazing hot take right there, uh, but just keep this in mind as we move on. Just keep this idea in mind that this is a toy box. Okay, we'll get on with the playthrough in a second. Just before we do, a quick rundown of the basic UI and mechanics. So the actual game is only in this rectangular screen in the center. The UI on the left right uh, these are like kind of like special gimmicks that m2 the devs uh, they like to add them to fill in the blank space when they port old games to widescreen consoles. They are purely optional, but in this case, um, they do show off some of the systems a little bit, so that kind of helps. So this is a very retro shmup, which means it has uh, a very complicated weapon system and a lot of pickups. Uh, the main pickups are these red and orange power pills. You can see a counter of them in the top right corner. Picking them up will do many good things. Uh, among others, it will upgrade my main shot, uh, which we obviously we start at level one right now, and it will go all the way up to level eight as we play this game. So keep an eye on the top right corner as we play through the game. Uh, we also have a secondary weapon. So there's actually six different ones and you can switch between them. You see them lined up all in this kind of matrix on the bottom right. Each weapon has a letter associated with it and you can swap between, between the different weapons by picking up a special, um, you know, a secondary weapon power up and it has like letters on it and the letters will cycle through. And depending on which letter you pick up, you will switch to a different weapon from this, uh, from this selection. And now they all do different things and we're gonna see them in action uh, at some point or another. But uh, some of them are just straight better than others. And in this playthrough, you will see me favor the secondary weapon C, which is kind of like this, uh, these plasma balls that are homing on um, to the enemies. So I think that's it. And we can start with the first level, finally. Right, so off the bat, this first level is a bit of a puzzle to me. And it's because that this is a very simple, very retro kind of level. Uh, it's, it's kind of reminiscent of, you know, like Space Invaders or something like Galaga. It was these very, very early simple shmups where you just really have like a, you know, star filled sky uh, and then some popcorn enemies are approaching you. And that's that's the whole thing, right? And the only thing that where you feel like they're doing something new, something exciting is now where you can see these gi giant capital ships approaching and you can blow them up and so I think like my running theory of this is that this is a bit of a flex of a tactical flex right now so I think um, developers were kind of like trying to push the game gear to you know show us those gigantic sprites and show off that they can push those gigantic sprites um, you can see that the you know, game gear will is kind of like struggling to put a lot of sprites on the screen at the same time this is a bit of a, you know, a simple shmup um, but the developers have figured out some kind of technique to to make those giant enemies happen and they want you to sh to show, show it to you and they also do it in a very methodical way where they first show you you know one ship and then two ships and then now you can see like one ship is moving and the other one is stationary so they can show you it appears as if they are uh, independent sprites where I, I think this is I'm not sure, but I think there's some kind of like manipulation of, you know, of the map or something. I'm not sure why I'm pausing here all the time. I think I scratched my nose here. 
Um, yeah, so I, I think this is a bit of a hardware kind of flex, and and I, uh, we're gonna see this maybe a bit later on when we go to the to the bosses. Another thing that that surprised me when I kind of looked exactly, you know, I did actually a bit of a thorough analysis of this first one level. Uh, something that surprised me is how many different enemies we are encountering here. So these are there are at least seven different enemy sprites, popcorn enemy sprites, plus um, the capital ship. So in total of eight different enemy sprites. Uh, and uh, all those different enemies also sometimes have different behaviors. Um, so this is a huge variety of different things just in this very, very short little first level. Um, and um, I think that's something that the new um, developers who are coming in and making the first map, that's something that they underestimate, how much variety those uh, veteran devs put into those little simple games, how much creativity there is in here. And again, that's something I talked about um, just now, like this is like this toy box design, right? There are so many cool little toys here and the fun of the game is, is experiencing all the, the variety that is on offer here. And so now we're coming to the final boss here, and I think that's kind of like a really beautiful uh, ending to this, this this flexi level here, where I can show you this gigantic, beautiful robot with huge lasers shooting at you, you know, just going all out. This is a huge power trip, uh, and it's not really like a big challenge or anything, it's a very, very simple enemy, but one that is very, very fun to look at and then very fun to blow up like this. I'm not sure if I'm a really a fan of this opening for this game, but you can't deny that they show you some really impressive sprites and we are just getting started. Wave 2, a last messiah. The, the names of the levels are, are a bit ridiculous. Right, so um, this is a beautiful level and the, the one that I really enjoy, especially for the kind of story it tells. So you can see we are starting out um, above like this beautiful lush green landscape uh, with some birds and everything. It seems like we are in a kind of earth-like environment and even though it transitions here to a bit of a city landscape it still feels like we are you know went from space back to earth um, and generally that's I, I told you that i want uh, us to think a little bit differently about storytelling when we talk about storytelling in shmups i don't want uh, us to think about storytelling in terms of cutscenes or you know characters talking to each other or anything like this um, but I want us to think of storytelling as in a very abstract way as you know just things changing over time so when I talk about you know how this level tells a story I want to see what changes over time throughout this level and like a very obvious and straightforward thing that changes in shmups all the time is kind of like just what you fly above uh, the background that you see here, I think, is a good thing to focus on. And so you can see, like, now we have, like, suddenly, like, this reveal where we started out over this Earth-like environment, but now we transitioned into this kind of, like, space station kind of environment. It is this twist reveal that uh, what we've seen before is actually not the Earth, but actually we are inside this giant space station. Uh, it seems to be like an O'Neill cylinder, which is kind of like this concept from the 70s, like this giant pipe-like space stations uh, that you maybe see in, in Babylon 5 or something, you know. Uh, I think they are also quite prominently featured in uh, Gundam, Mobile Suit Gundam. And so this is like this really awesome, cool twist reveal that you are suddenly in this kind of like weird, um, crazy, outrageous, gigantic scale of environment. They do some really nice parallax scrolling here to kind of sell you on the idea that you are in this giant open space and you're fighting some cool mechs here as well. So this is really, really cool um, and in a good way of kind of like uh, subverting expectations of the audience, of leading them in and showing you just awesome environments um, in a way that is kind of like really inspiring and fun and, and, and surprising. And again, uh, tapping into this, this toy box idea that, that you just see cool techie stuff, cool science fiction stuff. It's a cool science fiction story. Here. Right. Um, oh, again, I'm not, I'm not sure why I'm pausing here, but... <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry about that. Uh, here is an enemy that I really love. It seems like a little mini boss. I don't think it actually comes up later on in the game, so it's like this very unique sprite that I also like really enjoy, like this cool, I know, mushroom kind of kind of thing. And here at this point, you see there's like little red dot flying uh, in the background. Uh, that is a foreshadowing for something that uh, comes up in the, at the end of the level here. So here we see the transition to the third phase of the level. Um, we kind of like go into over back over to this kind of like uh, uh, jungle uh, forest landscape and and uh, fly closer to to the surface, so to speak, again. 
Uh, and now we are in this kind of like spaceport kind of thing where we see uh, hangars and, and, and maybe uh, like a, yeah, like ships or spaceships or something um, ready to take off. But then, sudden reveal. Dun dun dun. Oh no! Something is destroying the space station. It blows up. <laughs> Yeah, now we are among the debris of the space station, and who was responsible? Who is responsible for this destruction? It is the bad guy, the final boss. What an awesome reveal. With gigantic swords, he cut the space station in, into pieces. And now we are fighting the bad guy. What an awesome enemy. What a real beautiful build up throughout this entire level. Just seeing this beautiful landscape at the beginning, and then seeing like the awesome scale of the space station, and then seeing it destroyed. And then you have to fight the enemy. The enemy design is also really cool here because, as I already talked about so far, this Gears game has been pretty, pretty easy, pretty, pretty much a pushover. But this enemy has some attacks that, if you don't know them, uh, he will definitely kill you here. Um, so this is the first enemy that really gives you a bit of a challenge, um, but in a very easy way. Like if once you know the attacks, you can avoid them quite easily. Uh, so you're on your second attempt, you probably will be able to avoid the attacks already. So you get like this cool, like learning experience. Um, the way you get them from something like Dark Souls, where they also have like this, you know, cheap attacks that get you. But then once you know that there's an ambush coming at some point, then you can easily avoid it, and so you get this, this learning experience. And so yeah, now we see at the beginning we go to Earth into level three. All right, wave three, Terra Driver, Terra Diver. Okay, so this is another classic, classic shmup level where we are, well, we're starting out, we are on Earth, we're starting out on, on, at sea, but we're soon transition into a harbor kind of environment. And I think, again, talking about the toy box design, this is such a fantastic place to, um, to have a shmup level in. Um, it's because, you know, you know, harbor is a transition between sea and land. So you are able to uh, tap into a huge variety of different vehicles to show off. And they absolutely take advantage of that here. So we get, uh, you know, we get to see air vehicles. We have, uh, you know, different types of helicopter kind of ships. Uh, we see ground vehicles, or at least not vehicles, but ground installations. We have these, um, these um, turrets here that show up for the first time. And also we all have uh, sea vehicles, so different type of hovercraft and, and, and boats. And um, it, it all comes together here and it's just like this huge, beautiful um, you know, collection of, of toys to play with. And they're, they're all so cute. The, the, the tanks are so, so, you know, little and chubby with the stubby, um, stubby little turrets. It's really fun. And I, you can really see that the um, level design finally kind of really ramps up. We get to see a lot of interaction with the ground, which is really fun. Um, and uh, especially here in this kind of sec sequence, you see how they can kind of really forcing you to choose between left and right. Uh, there's, you know, when you're uh, still pausing, I'm sorry. I didn't know that it would re get recorded on the replay. Um, so yeah, they choosing you, um, making you choose between left and right. And also, especially the turrets here are quite a bit of a danger. They, they can saturate the screen with a lot of bullets. And uh, so if you ignore them, you, you will get into trouble. So they really make you learn the secrets of, the, of those turrets. So you're always aligned and destroy them quickly enough. If you destroy them quickly enough, then the level becomes a lot easier. So this is a really, I think, the first level where you really have to uh, practice, when you have to learn what the level layout to in order to complete it, um, complete it uh, with, uh, with no trouble or with less trouble than you would uh, usually have. This is, the, the, I think, the first level when I, like, when I first played through, this is the level that I died. Uh, for sure, like go and completely game over. And again, something that I already talked about in the previous level, but they really make sure that they always transition to a different place, to different places that sound that feel different. It's not just like horror for the entire duration of the level. They switch to the different environments. So for example, here we can suddenly go um, into this kind of like monorail situation where you have these weird rails in the background. And that will probably be the most one of the most annoying parts of this level that caused me the most frustration st still do um, because we get to see those monorail enemies again toy box design so many different toys to play with now we have these cute little monorails from hell uh, because they come from top uh, quite randomly and quite fast and then once they go to the bottom they go up again and it's very awkward to hit them if you don't have the right weapon that's why in this sequence i like to focus especially on uh, rely especially on my favorite weapon which is the c weapon um, it really allows you to hit um, those enemies uh, when they're coming from the back. 
um, yeah, it's it's a bit of an annoying sequence, a bit of a, a challenging one that, that can uh, lead to sudden and unexpected deaths many times. Mm, but now for this like, mid boss, this is the first mid boss that we see in this game. Uh, we I have to I kind of like switch to this beam weapon um, uh, because I actually wanted to probably have the different one, the F web weapon. I think I made a mistake here. Um, this is a really annoying boss as well <laughs> because he uses like these grenades that they launch that uh, they launch at you, and the grenades explode when uh, on impact, and then the explosion still can hurt you uh, for a good while after it exploded. And um, it's generally one of my least favorite shots to uh, to encounter in this game because um, it, 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 you sometimes die and don't know what. Um, usually explosions don't hurt you in this game, but now there's suddenly there's an explosion that hurts you. It's it's just a bit annoying. It's, it's visually difficult to parse, understand what is happening if you get hit by it. Right, and for this last sequence, um, we are going to go over these kind of like highways full of tanks. Uh, uh, again, showing you just a different type of environment, different type of challenge. They do a really good, good job here. And I actually made a mistake here. I picked up the wrong power up and that's some, something that's actually quite fascinating in terms of gameplay where you have like this this secondary weapon power up that cycles through different uh, letters and some of the uh, weapons that you get from this power up can be actually not that great and in this case the D weapon uh, is the least good one the, the one that's basically garbage uh, although it has some uses in some cases we're gonna see that later on um, so um, if you have the weapon that you want to have and if you want to keep um, those power-ups actually become kind of like an enemy. You don't want to touch the power-up if you have the weapon that you want to keep. Um, and uh, actually the power-ups can quite often cause so much stress that they are they feel more dangerous than the enemy sometimes because you really don't want to touch the power-up and you cannot shoot them down. It's really really funny. But yeah, for the final boss here I was able to switch to the C and we're gonna encounter the submarine boss after this little pause. Uh, I really love the submarine boss. Uh, it's really, really fun. Again, I love all of the bosses in this game, but this one isn't particularly impressive. I love, I love the fish tail uh, that he's going on for here. And also it's really fun because it's a, a two-phase boss, the first time that we really have a two-phase boss. So first we have this phase where um, you, the boss is still submerged and you're just fighting the tower and you have to deal with these mines. But then if you destroy the tower, the boss comes out of the water and then the attacks completely change. Um, they are super annoying, the attacks. It took me a while to get the hang of them and it's still like, not quite right reliable. Uh, the idea here is that um, there's these um, targeting reticules and they will they kind of like tease that there's going to be an explosion there in a second coming from above and you have to avoid those reticules. Um, but sometimes they corner you in and uh, there's no good way to avoid it. Uh, but in this case, I succeeded and uh, this thing blows up. The they bosses are so simple in this game, it's just, just a few attacks that give them a huge amount of mileage. I love them. Alright, wave 4, the perfect rage. So this is an interesting level. This is a level that, um, in terms of like what's happening, like the setting that we're in here is a bit puzzling, it's a bit um, badly defined, we're not really sure where we are. Mm, it seems like some kind of installation, some kind of um, a factory, maybe, uh, or uh, maybe we're underground in some kind of tunnel. Uh, it's not entirely clear why we're here and what is this is. Uh, not my favorite level in terms of setting, but it is quite pretty. Um, something that is really impressive generally with this game is how colorful it is. Like if you think about, oh, we're just gonna make a factory, you would think that it would, would be just gray and gray. But here you see like these um, brownish tones, you see the bluish tones, you see the red blinking lights. It's really, it's just uh, such a beautiful game. Uh, in terms of game design uh, or level design, um, this is generally uh, a continuation of the things that we saw in the level before. So we see, this is a level that is designed to kill the player. Uh, for reals now, the gloves are off. Uh, the first two levels at least were definitely like this kind of power trip situation um, where even like an like, unexperienced player can expect to get in pretty far, uh, but now you really have to pay attention at really, uh, uh, or even memorize like the layout. Um, one of the biggest challenges here are these turrets. Uh, they even, now even they're stationary and uh, mobile on, these, on this conveyor belts, which is really fun. And so the turrets can really easily saturate the screen with, with bullets and so you have to pay attention to the background, shoot them now immediately when you see them or if you, uh, or just like memorize where they are. So you, you shoot them uh, well in advance. 
And again, still, even though this is like this uh, anonymous factory tunnel kind of thing, uh, the game still makes sure to give you a variety of, you know, scenery changes to kind of show different parts of the factory that looks visually and feels different. Like now, that like what is happening now? We're just flying sideways. What is this crazy? Uh, so yeah, this is train sequence. And this train sequence has the, these annoying shots that I talked about before where you have like these grenades that are being thrown in the air and they describe an arc and when they explode, the explosion actually is the thing that hurts you and so you have to pay attention to uh, what is in the air and where they will land. Um, something I don't, don't talk about but I will actually uh, use for the first time here is uh, you see this green uh, shield around my ship. This is something, another thing that gets activated once you collect enough of the power pills. Um, and if you have enough of them, you will have like this, this is called the G field and you can see it underneath the portrait, it is active right now. Uh, it means that when I get hit once, um, instead of losing a life, I will just lose the shield. Um, generally shmups don't have uh, health points, a lot of shmups don't have health points. There are shmups with health points, but let's not talk about them right now. I kind of like that a lot of shmups are... Um, specifically not using health points that uh, getting hit once is bad. See, now I got hit. I think that was by a stray shot or something. So I lost my green shield. Um, yeah, anyway, so shmups don't have health points. So getting hit once uh, means, means that you lose a life. And that's great. That's a really cool challenge. And, and it's fun to, to deal with kind of this limitation. Um, but it also means that sometimes you get hit by a stray shot. And it's kind of annoying if you lose your entire run because of that. So I kind of like how they introduced you to um, this kind of like little... They introduced this little uh, trick here, this little system that kind of uh, takes care of that, that smooths out uh, the situation and that, you know, getting hit by a stray shot uh, doesn't necessarily ruin your playthrough as long as you can, uh, you know, recharge your shield. As you guys can see, you can... I have now seven power pills collected and I need 22 for the shield to recover. Uh, and this is a really, so this is like the second mid-boss now that we have here, right? I switched to a, specifically to a different um, weapon, to this fire weapon, because this fire weapon, uh, it fires a bit slower, it's not uh, homing like the other one, but it um, sometimes it destroys incoming projectiles like it does here. And I think for this boss it kind of works well. Uh, it's not clear which projectiles are getting destroyed by it or not, it's a bit, a bit changes, it seems like it changes. Um, but it um, definitely helps out thinning out the dangers coming from this boss. Now I switch to the sea weapon again because I think most of the turrets on the top of this, I don't know, rolling skyscraper are taken care of. Yeah, yeah. Generally, I really love the, the pills that you collect, the, the power pills, because I can, as you can see now that they exploded, um, uh, when you destroy uh, the, the power up ship that it, uh, spills out the, the power pills, um, you get multiple power pills, but they also like jump out into this kind of like parabolic arc and then spread out And I think that's a really cool trick to motivate players to fly towards um, The enemies and to especially towards the power pill uh, ships um, to um, Because if you can collect the power, power pills while they're still you know together while they clump together and you can get more of them at the same time uh, but if you are far away from the power pill ship, it will it will, will, will be more difficult to, to to pick up all of them. You will get less power pills from that. This is a beautiful boss enemy. This is a giant enemy crab, and every enemy, every every arcade game needs a giant enemy crab as a boss at some point. I think this is kind of like a staple. Um, it is just so beautiful. It's uh, the colors are so vibrant, and and it's just so iconic. I love it. Um, they also do something, this is this bit of a bullet hell type of enemy. As you can see it has like this kind of like crazy bullet hell pattern that you can navigate between. And in bullet hell types of shooters you usually what you want to do is you want to, you know, you have to, you want to navigate between the different bullets. You want to navigate the labyrinth of the bullets. But in order to do that they often give you like this ability to slow down your ship. So you can, you know, hit the gaps easier. Uh, in this case, you don't really have, like in LS, you don't have the, the button that does that. But this boss does like this bubble attack and the bubble attack slows down your ship and that actually allows you to navigate between the bullets. Kind of like really neat how they include that uh, without giving you this extra ability. Wave 5, Lunar Crisis. So um, this level is interesting. It is a bit of a change of pace. Um, so I've been talking about how these um, the, the level designers here managed to make the, the levels feel uh, interesting by changing up, you know, 
uh, sh what the background shows in each individual level throughout the level. And then, but now we see this kind of applied to the meta scale, so to speak. We see uh, after two levels that were kind of like meat and potatoes, and we see a complete change of uh, the, the uh, game design. Uh, kind of a movement of the ship, uh, which we're gonna see in a second. But we also see a change of the enemies that we're fighting. So there are these like spidery enemies, robots that we're fighting here. We haven't seen them before, and that's kind of shocking, right? Because I talked about how we have like these very huge selections of enemies uh, just in the first very few first uh, level. Um, but um, it's not like they're you know they fired everything they had at you from the first level. They were still holding back because they are able they're so late in the game they're able to switch. A completely different selection of enemies and this is now the crazy reveal and there we had this uh, huge pipe that we were flying above and the reveal is that this pipe is actually a gigantic rocket and now comes a twist now uh, that they kind of like there's there's a shift into there's a twist uh, in two ways and first of all um, uh, we are not looking actually at the scene from the top down. Uh, what we see underneath is not actually down, we are uh, looking from the side on the rocket that is going into space and the, basically the pilot pulled up the ship and is flying vertically upwards. And also another twist is that now we are, uh, when we're going left and right, we are actually turning around, uh, we're, we're circling the rocket. Uh, and they do this thing where if you go left you kind of like deviate from the center of the screen But if you let go of the d-pad you return to the center and I got a bit of a careless here And I, I hit an enemy and that means I am uh, I lost my shield uh, so uh, Something that's even more confusing is that if you go left and right the enemies will also scroll because they, they Basically stay in place as you circle the, the rocket. It's it's a bit of a confusing level uh, I appreciate really that they're trying something here um, but also, like a lot of people, they watch uh, replays off. They were kind of like uh, confused by what's happening here, and it's kind of difficult to get used to this. And what's even worse, kind of like there's something that really makes um, twists the knife a little bit here, is that the enemies are kind of like tricky here. Now, first of all, let's let's appreciate that uh, there are these jets, like these planes, right? But they do look a bit different, right? They are kind of like this reddish, obsidian reddish com com combination, uh, and also, they have like this kind of like triangular shape. Let's keep that in mind for now. Um, but also something that is a bit of a bummer is that they have like these kind of, uh, not these one, but the space, the, the jets. Ah, oh, see, I got cornered here and got, got shot down. The, so I think this is my first, uh, first uh, life loss, if I count it correctly. Um, so the, these triangular jet enemies, they have like this kind of rubber band behavior where they kind of lock onto you and, and try to get closer to you. Uh, and if you're very, very far away, they get really fast. So uh, sometimes you will, uh, you know, you have nothing on the screen and suddenly this enemy comes in at a gigantic high speed and it's very difficult to avoid them. And it's very difficult to predict how will they fly because they seem to be, their movements are so erratic. Uh, and it, it, this goes for on forever. This is like a very, very long sequence. So this was definitely some place where I would often just lose lives and there is not really a good way to practice this, I feel like it's, it seems a bit, a bit unpredictable. Yeah, you see like they constantly fly in at very high speeds and sometimes you're just, there's nothing you can do it seems. Uh, but yeah, something that really sweetens the deal on this level is the banging soundtrack. This is basically, I think this is the best uh, piece from the soundtrack, which is generally really good. And uh, so yeah, as the uh, young people say, this music definitely slaps. No, generally something I talked about is how once you lose a life, uh, this can mean the end of the run. And I want to maybe clarify what I mean. Because, you know, just losing a life is not a big deal, right? But the problem is that uh, you get this Gradius effect where if you lose a life, you also lose some of the upgrades. Uh, and uh, you sometimes need the upgrades to kind of like stay alive uh, late in the game. Uh, they kind of like make this a bit easier here because you just lose one level of upgrade for all of your weapons. So it's not like you're losing everything like in Gradius, but it's still kind of like uh, that late in the game can hurt your run a lot. So this is kind of like a very tricky final boss or like a mid boss here, which uh, again, let's keep that design in mind for a second here. And you really have to shoot him down very quickly because he then upgrades his attacks to a more vicious one if you don't and that can really as well you know be the end of you very very quickly uh, now we've reached the end of the rocket and that the end of the rocket is a bit of a disappointment i think 
I was expecting to, to see the payload of the rocket, like what does the rocket put into space? And it's just like this weird top and that's it. It's not even not even like a machine or anything, it's just like this cap. It's, it's weird. I expected, you know, to see maybe some kind of payload to be transported in orbit or maybe some kind of fairing or something. Maybe the idea is that it tra transported the boss into orbit, but I don't think they communicate this very well. And uh, I think this is a bit of a, bit of a letdown to this otherwise really spectacular level, I think. Uh, doing some pauses here, I'm not really sure. I think I'm really afraid of the boss that is coming up here because this is one of the most toughest bosses in this game. Uh, and I did a lot of practice on this one, so I think I can do it, but uh, it just he has a lot of attacks. So dun dun dun, this is really nice. Uh, the, so the mid boss that I was struggling with earlier actually uh, plugs into this suit and now it turns the jet turns into a robot and then also he steals all my uh, secondary weapons basically so I have to uh, fight this boss with just a primary weapon which is tough and you know the attacks are very vicious here very very crazy but also the design is crazy right so the boss has a very distinct design from all of the enemies that we've encountered so far it's like this weird um, again this triangular angular shape a diamond like shape everywhere and um, you know the obsidian a deep red combination. Um, so that's some, that's the design language that we're going to see later on uh, a lot of times. Uh, I, I really like that they chose like this very specific distinct style for a certain type of enemies that we I'm going to talk about in the next level. And yeah, so these are very very tough uh, attacks that you that you fight with, and then you get back the um, at some point you get back your secondary weapon. Uh, but again, he switches so many. There's so many attacks, and you have to. Make sure that you learn, you know, the patterns and, and you see them coming and you know where you have to be at any given point to defeat him. And yeah, this definitely is a run ender of a boss and I'm happy that I was able to defeat him with uh, seemingly no problem. Ah, wave 6, level 6, Whale Cry. Weird name, but this is one of my favorite levels. It is very, very long and it includes a major kind of plot twist that is done very, very well. Uh, I really love this level and I've been playing it a lot because it is a very hard level too, but still very well designed. So it begins at this kind of very, again, star-filled sky background, um, very simple uh, uh, looking level, but then you have this reveal that you see the surface of this uh, gigantic spaceship. Uh, so this is kind of like, you know, this epic space battle where small ships are strafing, you know, giant capital cruisers and you are... Um, you're approached by these enemies that look exactly how your own ship looks like, um, but with the red cockpit. So I think this is kind of like this. If you haven't read the backstory, then at least at this point you uh, definitely know that uh, this is a situation where you're fighting your own, your own military. Mm, so I think the reveal here is that you know the Earth military, the Earth Defense Force, has been hacked uh, by some kind of unknown force and uh, the, uh, their own weaponry has been turned against them. And the red cockpit is the giveaway. Uh, it kind of shows you that they have been uh, turned, changed. And if you look back at all of the enemies, that you, all of the end bosses, especially that you fought, all of them had you know, red cockpits or, or red eyes. And I really love this um, strafing uh, um, setup here, this, this uh, encounter design here, where you have like these slowly scrolling um, turrets uh, from the side, uh, this asymmetric uh, screen layout here but also those ships approaching you so now that we know that that you know uh, we've been hacked the question is who hacked us who's responsible who's the bad guy now oh, I've been hit by a bullet here it was a bit unfortunate so who's responsible and now comes the reveal the 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 mask off moment where it's ah it's some kind of weird freaky uh, you know diamond shaped aliens and that's kind of like a very typical very very iconic design of, of, of the aliens that they associate with the alien aliens. This this kind of like um, again this this weird uh, rectangular uh, diamond shaped look and in the very specific very uh, uh, you know particular uh, shade of red. And I think the attacks here from this boss are also kind of um, reminiscent of the top of the rocket that we had in a previous level. So I think um, maybe this was the thing that was transported in the rocket. I don't know. Um, but yeah, now when you blow it up, all those little tiny little freaky enemies, uh, diamond shaped enemies come out and now we have like this uh, complete vibe shift in this level where suddenly the enemies we were fighting are completely different. 
uh, they're no longer these kind of like earth uh, ships but now they're these freaky uh, diamond shaped aliens very reminiscent of the boss of the previous level so that kind of explains that it's also a little bit foreshadowed in the previous level already and that's something i that's i think very important now you know throughout the previous levels i've talked about how storytelling is um you know just just having something change over time uh, but it's not just the change over time you kind of also have to make sure that you leverage this to create meaning to make something that you know meaningful and i think level two achieved that so far pretty well other levels were not quite as successful but i think this level really does a good job here and especially this reveal here that we are now revealing this surface of this gigantic mothership that we are and that we are flying over and and uh, it has been kind of infected pro in somehow corrupted by the diamond shaped aliens and you are um, destroying the surface of it and there's the aliens coming out of its guts and it's it's this very frantic scene i love it and i love how the camera sways left and right so it looks um, um, so it looks even more unhinged and and uh, desperate and frantic and you have these huge gigantic like they they have these plates of of this purple which is I think, associated with the aliens and underneath that's the cool gray of, of the earth forces so this ship has been kind of like remodeled infected and and corrupted by the alien influence i love this this is such a striking image and such a beautiful sequence here that is just very very memorable and and uh, uh, you can tell that you, that we're that you know the story is coming to a point that we're approaching the finale of, of this encounter of this entire story uh, in in a spectacular fashion it just looks everything just looks so beautiful here and this is now one of the most important uh most, most difficult not maybe not the most important def definitely one of the most difficult bosses in the game one that have, i haven't practicing a lot and that's why i'm making a pause here because i have to re really like psych myself up a little bit here uh this is a very difficult this is basically the bridge of the ship that we're flying over i think and it's obviously completely corrupted by alien presence and there's like those turrets on the left and right and i have to clear them up as quickly as possible because there's also grenades flying at me all the time and then also there's this laser and uh, i have to clear up the turrets so i have the space to navigate to, so i can uh, you know escape this laser shot and it's just so frantic it's so difficult i've been hit by another bullet there and um uh, yeah, I've been practicing this encounter a lot, but it's still it's difficult to consistently pull this off. Um, it is it, it, this could be easily just the final boss of the game, but you know we still have like an entire game coming up, so, and this is not even the final boss of this level. So it's it's kind of crazy how much they're throwing at you. Just like two mid bosses now, and the final boss, and that's still not it's just still the penultimate level. Mm, so it's kind of weird that you destroy the bridge and then there's still more ship coming up. It's a bit awkward there. I think it would have been nicer if you could somehow like fly into the ship or something. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure why they did it. Maybe the, it was technically difficult to pull off. And actually, like it still goes on. This level still has some some things that it throws at you. I sometimes got hit by this this massive amount of turrets behind the bridge. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of uh, surprising that that it still co continues. Also, I like that some of the enemies that you uh, sh shoot off the um, the armor, and then there's like a crab underneath, so to speak, that you still have to kill. Like there's like this two-stage enemy design here. That's nice. So I think we blew up the ship, uh, but now we are fighting the core of the ship. And I think I I'm not sure, but I, my, my interpretation is that this is basically a com the computer of the ship. So we're gonna have a mother ship, uh, mother computer. Uh, and uh, the, that computer has been infected by the alien presence and that computer has been doing all of the hacking. And so now you have to destroy the core, the, the computer core of the ship. And it's a bit of a difficult encounter uh, that also I've been practic practicing a lot. Um, uh, this is a bit difficult because you have like those walls around you that surround you and the collision with the, with the, balls, uh, with the walls means that you are gonna die immediately. And there's, you have to do some navigation, uh, avoiding some attacks while avoiding the collision with the walls, which is a bit annoying. Uh, again, it's very simple, the, you know, three-stage uh, uh, encounter. Uh, and this last phase is also very difficult to pull off because it's kind of unpredictable where the ball is going to go. And so you kind of have to like re uh, rely on your re reflexes. But yeah, that's a, an ending of a spectacular level that I really enjoy. And man, I would love to talk more about it, but we have to move on to the final level. 
And uh, here we are, the final level, level number seven, into the abyss. They do a really cool thing here where they show you the little cutscene. They usually don't really bother doing like transitions between levels uh, up, up until now, but you know, this is the final level, so they really want to make a point here. So you're going through the Stargate uh, and you fly through hyperspace and you are going to uh, mount a counter-offensive on the alien fleet. Uh, and this sequence here is especially challenging. Uh, it is a bit of a, a bookend to the story, I feel. Uh, it is a bit of a um, you know throwback to how the entire story began in the first level. Um, you saw us uh, fighting these kind of like big frigates, uh, these big sprites that I talked about that were a bit of a technical flex. And we're kind of back to the same kind of enemy design, roughly, but this time we are not fighting against uh, Earth frigates, but against um, uh, alien ships. And those alien ships are kind of tough. Uh, the frigates in the first level are a bit of a pushover, but these are really, really tough. And that's something I talked about, like if you get killed um, multiple times fighting the, uh, the previous bosses from the previous level, the big bridge of the uh, mothership and the computer core, if you get hit a couple of times uh, during those fights, then your level, uh, the level of your weapons will be underpowered, and then these ships will be very difficult to defeat because they really take a lot of damage. Um, right now, it's uh, I'm I am fully powered, I think. Yeah, uh, so it seems like like this is a bit of a pushover. It seems like it's not that difficult, but I can tell you it can get very very tough, and that will uh, potentially end your entire run. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, able to get through here and we are out of the hyperspace and then we are approaching the enemy fleet and I, again, like the, I talked about the toy box design, there's just such a variety of different enemies that we sh see here. And you can see already in the background, you can see far in the distance, you see more stargates and you can see, you know, just a, a huge line of enemy ships approaching the stargates and getting into the stargates, presumably attacking, uh, you know, Earth. So yeah. Um, again, I was talking about, uh, I regained my shield, that's really nice, and I talked about, and there's, for example, these bombers that, that uh, occasionally go from the bottom of the screen, or this enemy that I just killed, and that uh, shoots very, very fast lasers that are sometimes difficult to avoid. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty plenty of uh, really tough enemies happening here, and I'm really benefiting from the C weapon here. So I've been cheating a little bit, because the C weapon uh, kind of slows down, it causes some slowdown to happening. I think the homing missiles here kind of tax the CPU a little bit, and uh, I, that's why one of the reasons why I prefer the C weapon. It, it kind of gives uh, uh, gives me a bit more time to react to things. And it, I know it's a bit cheap, and you can turn this off in the emulation. You can make it so that there is no slowdown at all. But yeah, I'm not such an experienced map player, so I rely on this trick a little bit. But I switched to a different weapon here at this point. This is such a good sequence. So you can see those turrets shooting from the sides, but you also always have a tank in, in the center. And so you really have to prioritize. You get like shot from all of the directions. You want to like shoot down maybe all of the turrets first, but there's so many of them. And the tank, if you don't shoot the tanks uh, down quickly enough, they switch to a different pattern, a shot pattern that is really, really annoying. And there's even like popcorn enemies coming at you. It's just so much, it throws so much at you. And something I really enjoy is that there's even like two different tank designs happening here. They could just they could repeat the same tank, but no, they actually mix it up and show you different tanks. So I'm just really impressed uh, at, uh, you know, how much variety uh, this game offers to you, how they make sure that you always see something new and exciting in this game. I, I just really love it. And again, this encounter is like really intense and very difficult. And I switched to the D weapon that I, you know, up until now was kind of useless. But I switched to the D weapon here because uh, with the D weapon I can... The D weapon, uh, the, those, those crystals that circle me, they typically soak up the shots uh, from the turrets that come from all sides. And so I can really focus on uh, making sure that the tanks are getting shot down quickly enough before they switch to this more devastating uh, shot pattern. So yeah, yeah, this this really feels desperate, and and you feel, really feel overwhelmed. There is like it's very difficult, or it's basically impossible, to shoot down all of the turrets and all of the enemies here. So you really have to pick your battles, and then you really need to uh, find a way of how you want to get through this incredible barrage of of uh, of enemies and and uh, bad guys, alien bad guys. It's uh, that's just so fun. And again, you still have to keep in mind that you know you have to memorize the level a bit. And you have to remember when the bombers from the from back are coming in, and when you have to watch out. So um, so yeah, you have to definitely uh, 
practice this level a lot until you until you get it right. I des definitely did. Okay, so now we are, but you know, the game still makes sure that you are always being shown something interesting, uh, some new challenge here. And this is actually, this sequence is why I actually decided to always switch to the D weapon, because this is actually quite interesting. So you have like these mm, red uh, crystals embedded in this matrix. And if you shoot those red crystals, they um, burst and shoot weapon, uh, shoot, shoot bullets at you. And so usually when I had the C weapon here, they, the C weapon would destroy all of the red crystals and shoot like a whole bunch of bullets at, at, at me from different sides. And that was like almost impossible to avoid while also shooting down uh, the turrets and, you know, avoid the, the blocks that come at you. So um, I feel like this, specifically the sequence is designed to punish you if you always rely on the C weapon and really make you appreciate the, the D weapon um, that is kind of like designed to, um, you know, protect you against uh, against uh, bullets coming from the sides. But again, if you, the D weapon is not fully upgraded, then uh, it sometimes lets some bullets through and then you're kind of screwed here as well. So you really need to make sure that um, you know your weapons are fully upgraded at this point. Otherwise you are in for a bad time. And I, I, I mean, this is just like, now they're really just trying, just, you know, really crazy things. So this is now this kind of like snake type of enemy that reminds me of that, you know, old arcade game Snake where you have like these kind of blocks uh, moving this weird snaky pa pattern here and shooting. Not a big challenge, uh, actually, it's, I think it's a bit too long, it, it, like it gets old uh, quickly. But I certainly do appreciate, you know, the creativity at display here. This is certainly a change of pace. Something I want to discuss, maybe this is a bit late here, but we have a bit of a time now. Um, there is certainly some limitations uh, in the hardware that's really uh, you know, kind of like uh, pose a challenge to the developers clearly and that's one thing that they were not able to pull off is or at least to make concessions to the hardware here is the there is a bit of a lack of visual feedback when you hit something uh, usually in shmups you see enemies flash red or white or whatever when you hit them and uh, this is not happening here and it's, especially if you're watching a re video replay a replay of somebody else playing this might be really confusing because you just see a lot of flickering and you're not, not quite sure what's happening i have to say like when you play the game it actually feels a lot more natural and uh, it's the sound design especially here that is doing the heavy lifting so you kind of have better sense that you're hitting something when you're playing the game simply because of the sound effects and especially in a scene like this it can be quite confusing if you're just watching uh, yeah, these are really cool enemies that are attacking us here. So these are basically like they have like these plasma balls and the plasma balls are coming out and then they continue chasing you. Uh, so you have to keep avoiding the balls that are already out, but you can also have to shoot at the new enemies coming in. It's kind of like a very tough final challenge here. But uh, and I actually got hit here as well. So that's kind of a bodes, uh, doesn't bode well for the final encounter for the final boss. But... Um, but yeah, I think we're slowly approaching the end of this game and it's, you know, it's this epic encounter. Obviously, what is going to be the final boss of this game about diamond-shaped aliens? Obviously, you're fighting a gigantic diamond. <laughs> I love this. This is so good. Um, so yeah, this feels properly like a final boss. It feels like the entire screen. And that's maybe also something to worth thinking about. So, you know, we have like this general, this notion that, you know, as we play a game, especially in a cape game like this, that we think that, you know, the game is supposed to get harder and harder. Mm. But this final boss is not the hardest boss in this game. It's, it's not a pushover, but there's some attack patterns that are kind of freebies. And you can see this here. And so he, the boss basically teleports. He uses like some kind of warp drive that's built in. And now we're in hyperspace. And now it does like these kind of like warp, uh, teleport warp uh, effects where it warps in a bunch of um, enemy ships but they're kind of easy to defeat kind of you just have to stand in place sometimes you have to reposition a little bit but uh, they are not a bit of, uh, not a big threat and that's okay I think that's fine I don't think um, you know the games have to be, get harder and harder as you uh, get into the latter levels I think um, there's a difference between uh, an encounter that's difficult and an encounter that's dramatic and this boss doesn't max out necessarily on the difficulty, but it certainly maxes out on the drama. And I love this, you know, um, where you eventually emerge after the high, out of the hyper lane, you realize that, oh, the boss has actually teleported itself with you, together with you, to uh, Earth. And we are now in Earth's orbit. 
and this is such a good such a good staging for the final fight you kind of like you see what's at stake right you see that the earth underneath you and you are defending literally defending earth from from the evil aliens this is so dramatic it's so good i love that they commit to this that they, they make sure that that this is uh, visually communicated and those final attacks here at the very very end they are uh, they're quite actually quite difficult you i did have to practice them a lot because they're kind of like they are, some of them are aimed and you don't even realize that they are aimed you have to uh, it's sometimes very difficult to avoid them but at this point i have so many lives left that um i think i have good chances to, to get through this you, you know that I, I will get through this because this is a one cc replay but i kind of like feel confident at this point that i can defeat this boss and yeah so this is my this is actually my second one cc uh, the first one CC I did, I actually just upped the number of lives that I start with to nine, so that didn't feel, uh, you know, like the real one CC. So uh, yeah, this is the real, this is the real one CC with just you know regular three lives. Yeah, this is this is um, GG LS3. It is a game I would normally thoroughly recommend. I think this is a very f fantastic shmup, especially if you're new to shmups. Uh, because it's very, very simple, very straightforward. Um, it is difficult, but it's not a pushover. You kind of have to practice a, a little bit to get the 1cc. You get that kind of like working towards the 1cc experience. But you also don't have to, you don't have to like dedicate your entire life to it. So I think it's quite achievable. Uh, the only reason why I maybe wouldn't necessarily you know, give you like a full recommendation for this game, why it might be difficult, is that um, it is quite expensive. Uh, you have to switch your Switch or PS4 to like the Japanese eShop anyway. Uh, and even then, you know, you have to pay, pay full price for this. I think the Japanese pricing for games is a bit different than here in the West. I think in the West here, it would be more of a, you know, 20 to $30 title. Uh, but there you have to full, uh, you have to pay the full price, which kind of hurts uh, because it doesn't seem like in like a triple A kind of experience. I do want to support the devs, so to me it was worth it, but I understand if it's not worth it to you. Now, something I want to discuss is how, you know, this is, I, I was talking about the story here, but let, let's be honest here, like the story is not, you know, Oscar kind of material. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty, some, you know, pretty familiar stuff, pretty familiar ground. And in fact, I think it's uh, deliberately so. Like, it seems to me like this is a bit of a homage to shmups of the 80s. Um, it kind of like repeats all of the tropes and, and uh, you know, hits all of the beats. And, and specifically, I think it's a homage to Raiden. It feels like an homage to Raiden. I might be wrong here. Do let me know. But it feels like, you know, the story of, you know, Earth's military being hacked by... Uh, uh, like uh, diamond-shaped uh, aliens. I think this is something that that was specifically there in Raiden as well. So uh, it might be just an homage here, but I'm fine with that. You don't have to like reinvent the wheel. There's a new Alest title coming up soon. Hopefully it will get a console re release. And that seems to be more of a innovative title. This seems to be more of a throwback, more of a retro experience. So to maybe to wrap this up, let's think about, let's talk about, you know, the takeaways here. And it's difficult to, to summarize everything. First of all, it's kind of difficult to apply certain design decisions here to a different kind of system with different hardware limitations. Obviously, a lot of the decisions are driven by hardware limitations here. Uh, and uh, the ones that you have to work with might be different. So in my case, I'm working with a Pico 8 system and that has just very different limitations I realized than they have here. They are using a lot of sprites, which I cannot do in Pico 8, but on the other hand, they cannot draw a lot of sprites on the screen, which I can do with Pico 8. So mm, not a lot of the lessons can be carried over one to one. And obviously, you know, there's a lot here. I've been playing this game for a long time. I've been I've been enjoying this a lot and, and I've been, you know, taking my lessons from this. I've been paying attention. And not all of the things that I've learned are things that I can just boil down to like this memorable quote or something. It just doesn't work like this. I think the reason why you have to sometimes experience these games is because you have to learn experiences yourself. You have to marinate in those games. But if there is something I want to take away from this experience is that I want to really think about how I structure my levels, that I do structure my levels, that I don't just like, you know, show some kind of background and just loop it for two minutes and call it a day, and that I actually, you know, maybe introduce chapters, maybe think about, you know, let's make this, uh, turn this level into something that has three phases. And those three phases will be very distinct from each other. We'll have different enemies, we'll have different backgrounds. And then, of course, uh, going one step further. 
thinking about how the different phases, different subchapter can interact with each other, how they can, how can, how I can leverage this kind of chapter structure to maybe create meaning, to create some kind of story, to set up reveals, to set up those dramatic encounters that can go such a long way to elevate the you know the action of the game to a whole new level. And the second takeaway here is you know this thing I've been talking about this toy box game design idea. I want to really remember how important variety is to the enjoyment of those games. So I want to remember you know not to get too complacent and to really push myself to iterate, innovate on especially the enemy encounters in those games because I think they are really key to the enjoyment of them. Uh, but yeah, you know, these are just things that I took away from this. Uh, so maybe there's something that caught your eye watching this. So do let me know if there's something that surprised you and that maybe you picked up watching this. And do let me know if there's something that you want me to look at. Maybe there's a shrub that you really like that you want me to play. I do have a video of Crimson Clover lined up and we might look at this uh, in the future. Speaking of the future, this is the moment where I will take a second to thank all those beautiful people that made this video possible through their generous support on Coffee. Thank you so much. I'm especially hyped and happy to see new supporter this month, including Pendletong, Liquid Dream, Groove MD, Lackmare, Creeper Speak, uh, Squidlight, AB and adware. In addition, uh, as always, special shoutouts to the regular Donut Plus uh, subscriber crew, including Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, The Coxworth, Cheapshot, One-Eyed Rabbit, Mario Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Paweł Szymczykowski, Scott Goldsmith, Bretzky, Emperor Snow, Hnork, and All Caps. And if you would also like to support my work and enjoy some special behind the scene access, some juicy bits about the upcoming shmup, you can do so at coffee.com slash lazydevs. Otherwise, see you next time guys, uh, bye bye.